I've done a lot of work on um, pushing fear back because I'm quite a confident person. Having come out as trans 37 years ago, you better deal with your fear. Otherwise, because I must have been in the first years, it was really tricky. But, you know, like scared of flying. Okay, learn to fly. Push that back. Uh, scared of performing because, you know, sta you know, stand up doing that acting on stage is tricky enough. Stand up and you just it's just yourself. So why not do it in French? And then that pushes the fear back. So when you do it in English, oh, that seems kind of easy to the French thing. <laughs> then you do it in German and then the French seems easy. And then you... <laughs> Um, yeah, so that this was my plan, and um, it, it's it's a good thing to fear management is is a good thing for people to do. Thank you, little applause. Oh. Um, no, no, so I just I just like the idea of it for everyone, for everyone <laughs> except the bad people. They should get the fear in, and they should all <laughs> drop down dead and go to hell. <laughs>trying to get to, I was always trying to get to cities like New York. So, um, and it's in lots of films as well. So, you know, the, the big cities are in lots of films. You go, oh, there's that, oh, that, oh, that, the thing. Oh, and I look out, because I go running down the, down the, uh, by, by the Hudson on the west side, and then I look out and say, look, the Statue of Liberty, it looks very small. Why is it so small? Because I'm far away, you see. <laughs> and if I get close, you get big. Uh, obviously, it's bloody huge when you get down down there. So, I just like, I just like being around. I love that. You are sensational in Great Expectations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. How did you decide on Great Expectations for your return to the theater? Ah, uh, long story here. Okay, here we go. Um, start of a 10, uh, I'm severely atypically dyslexic. I'm so like a high functioning dyslexic. I have half the traits, reading very slow, writing all over the place, spelling, totally phonetic. Um, but no one could really say, no one said this at school. And I found out when I was in my thirties, I was doing things that were dyslexic, dyslexic like. And so I found out I was, I got tested and that was my the thing they said. And so reading a book, reading books, not joy for me, it just takes forever. It's a slow thing. And it just, oh, you know, some people say, I don't know, some people here, cause I read a book last night. Well, I can't do that. I can't, I could possibly if it was a fantastic thing and not very big, but anyway, great difficulty at that. And I realized I'd never read a work of literature. Add to this, so I thought I should read one. I should read one, and audiobooks are on the rise, are on the rise. There are much more audiobooks out there than before because of listening on phones and in cars and stuff. So I thought, why don't I get a company, see if I can get a company to pay me to read a book. You see where the thing is? <laughs> this is, my dad was an accountant. This is a slight accountant in me, but quite a good, a nice accountant thing of saying, accountant encouraged me, rather than go for the money, the big money, it's a terrible film, but you make pots of cash and you can die in it. Instead of that, the little accountant to me said, get someone to pay you to read a work of great literature. And I'm 150 years younger than Dickens to the day. So that's 1st of, uh, 7th of February, uh, 1812, 7th of February, 1962. So I thought, let's do Dickens. And they advise great expectations. Boom, that's how it happened. So a few accidents in there. And I read the audio book. The audio book in all its majesty is out there, over 20 hours of book. And um, yeah, and then... I thought, why don't I do a stage of this? Because I could do a solo show. And if you do a solo show, the great thing is you don't have to say, when are you free? Oh, I'm free now, because I'm me. You know, because <laughs> I, I was, when I was starting off, I was a four-person act in comedy, then a two-person act. And I remember when we, I was a double act, um, we used to have meetings to discuss when we could have meetings <laughs> to discuss what we might change in the show. So our meeting to discuss when we could have a meeting, you know, that was how it went on. Whereas now I could on stage and I'm doing this curiously in Great Expectations. I can do this in stand-up where you can just say, oh, I'll talk about this, I'll talk about that. But 
within the lines of the dialogue, I do, I am giving Estella, Havisham, Pip, sometimes Joe, sometimes Herbert, uh, Wemmick, um, slightly latitude in what they say to each other. And sometimes they will say things which I'm not expecting them to say. <laughs> <laughs> because you do it like a chess game. If you really get into it, it's like a chess game. And the technique comes from Richard Pryor, who did it in Richard Pryor Live. And he had two characters going, hey, what are we doing here? You got you to get, you got, have, you, have you got the gun? I don't know the gun. I left it in the car. Why are you leaving the car? It's no good. And he did this sort of quarter turn thing, which I thought everyone did in stand-up. I thought, I'll do that in my stand-up because I came from sketch. So I've been doing that for 25, 30 years. And I thought, um, everyone else was doing it. But in an analysis, not everyone else is doing it. Like Robin Williams, the, the, your yeah. whole center is named after. Robin does something, uh, did something with his stand-up where he would uh, talk about a character and then the character would be there going, what's going on? And they, but they would essentially talk to the audience. They would, it wouldn't be necessarily a monologue, they'd just give a slice of that person's attitude, life, whatever it is. Whereas this, this sort of having two people going, hey, what's going on? I don't know what's going on. What is you change the voice, you change the physicality, and then you can get Havisham and Pip and and Marwich and um, 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 I forgot his name now. <laughs> He's in the show. I'm going to talk about him tonight. <laughs> but it's, uh, Bentley Drummer. That's it. Huh? Bentley Drummer, who I was playing as a slight idiot, and I realized he can't really be. An idiot. He's got to be a sort of an attractive oaf, I think. He's got to be like a big rugby player or something. Oh, oh. He's got to be kind of. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a machismo in there, something that Estella's going to go for. Um, so anyway, I, I, I've given them license to say different things, which my director's coming back to see the show, and I think she's going to go, Oi, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> but I'm going to say, well, I want to see what happens, because it's curious, and it just gives them this little wiggle room. So uh, what question was I answering? All that. All that. <laughs> That's obviously the answer to that question, but yes. Um, it's, and you got your brother involved too. Well, I, yeah. I, my brother wrote a book when he was younger, then he didn't write after that. And I've always thought he's probably more naturally talented than me. And I said to him, because he does all the translations to the French, German, and Spanish shows, to the Spectacle Francais, Alice Af Deutsch, and Toro en Español. And, and I thought, why don't we, because I feel there's a number of stories in me, to pull them out of me just takes a long time. So uh, I, I need to become, well, the Dickens, I think, wrote at speed and chucked things down. And I need to get these stories out of me. And I said, why don't we do this together? We're doing an adaptation together. And he said, OK. And then he said, I've done part one. They're in three parts. So I, he said, I've just done it. I went, oh, I was touring America. I was touring in, I was, where was I? So I'm the west of America. And, and so I said, OK, do you want to do part two? And he said, I'll do part two. And then he did part two very quickly. And then part three took some more time because it was, tying up bits but my brother mark my older brother he has cut down you know it's over 20 hours a book and it's a two-hour adaptation so that's 90 percent that you have to lose uh but the the critics seem to have liked what he have done and and uh, you know it's 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 trying to get the essence of the show um without everyone having to sit there for 20 hours <laughs> which would be a tough gig <laughs> Do you have a favorite character in the show that you play, and which ones do you relate to the most? Well, I can, I can relate to Pip, even though I've, I've never been given a bundle of money, but I have earned more money as going through my life. But I can understand that uh, um, quest for, for self-improvement, for moving forwards to getting into a better space. Um, I like playing Estella. Because part of me is a, as a trans kid, I grew up wanting to be a young girl, but also wanting to be a young boy. It's kind of weird. I am gender fluid. I just, I seem to have both genetics. And I think we all, anyone who's got a brain now is accepting we're all somewhere on this spectrum and we've got little sides of one and sides of the other. The chromosomes are already XX and XY. So that was already mixed to start off with, which was kind of obvious and right there. But we just spent thousands of years murdering each other over, no, it's not. Um, well, I didn't even know. <laughs> Yes, it is. So anyway, we're all somewhere on the spectrum. So everyone chill out about it. And everyone, a lot of people are chilling out. Some people aren't, but they're smelly people. And <laughs> as we know. And uh, so, yeah, to play Estella, to play the, a beautiful young girl who's also kind of a pain in the ass <laughs> is interesting. I hopefully wouldn't have been a pain in the ass if I'd been a beautiful young girl. But it, but it is interesting. But I can I can inhabit her and then have a shaman, yeah. the, the, what she's had and just, this this quest for I've got to I've got to train up first of all Pip as as a sort of dummy punching bag for 
for Estella. And then, um, and then I've got to um, just release Estella onto the world to destroy everything. And she forgot that you know Estella's going to have her own feelings on this, which um, which is what happens in the end. And um, yeah, so I, I think those characters, Magwitch. I think I can, you know, I, I can. I think that's what you've got to do as an actor. You've got to find that part of of Magwitch that's in you, that part of Miss Havisham that's in you, of Pip, of Herbert, and so I look for for for. I just enjoy being those characters for a short while. So um, yeah, I do like playing most of them. Is there anyone I don't like playing? Bentley Drummle. No, I could get into ben playing Bentley Drummle. Even you know, even complete pains in the asses, you know. I, I'm happy to do that. It's it, it's it's intriguing because you know you're not living that life. You just the more you can be inside it, the more you can bring the audience with you. And I'm I'm encouraging the audience. I don't know if anyone's seen the show, but yep. um, it's a thing that I was I'm doing accidentally. I didn't know I was doing this, but because I'm because I do these turns and I, I always have Miss Havisham's on stage. Right, that's when we go to a house. It's always there. Fireplace is there. Mr. Jaggers's office is always over there. Um, and I encourage the audience to paint in the details. So the more that I'm accurate when I'm turning and playing these different characters, if I'm if I'm here being Pip to Havisham over here, hopefully the audience is holding ha Havisham in their mind's eye as being there. And then when I flip around, I inhabit that place geographically. I stand there, then I stand back here so that, that your imagination is, is encouraged to be used. And I think sometimes the audience are giving me more brownie points because they've been good. I think you've been good. Um, and that's, I, I didn't plan it that way, but I think that's what happens. People going, I, I, I can see more, more than, there's nothing there. Oh, we know there is that. Now, we, now we've got a set. But initially I was doing it without a set and without, with just a general wash of lights and no music. So I've done a lot of performances like that. And people see things. And I think I, that's their imagination. Yeah. For those of you who have not seen this yet, it's playing through February 11th. The artistry of this person sitting next to me, I mean, you are razor sharp, yet you play them all with such ease. And I know that's not easy. And if that's where your artistry comes in, but your little Eddieisms too. I mean, it's wonderful to watch you work. Well, Dee Dee Hopkins has helped yeah. me to be very precise with the changes of characters. Um, there's occasional lines. I do put in Easter eggs of my own lines, <laughs> which, which should sound as much like Dickens as possible. And the example is uh, Uncle Pumblechook um, was a large, hard breathing man, face like a fish, dull staring eyes, and hair that stood up on the top of his head. And I changed it to Uncle Pumblechook was a large, hard breathing man, face like a fish, dull staring eyes, and hair that had obviously been arranged by a dying relative. <laughs> <laughs> which kills. Um, but I just thought, it does sound of kind of, there's obviously always dying relatives in Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, life seemed to, 1800s just full of people. I, I'm about God, I'm four. I, well, no, actually the young kids did go, but it was like, you're 25, I'm an old 25, I'm about to go. But just the idea of a dying relative say, Uncle Bumblechook, lean, I'll put, I think you should have, uh, that, that's good enough. That's good enough. <laughs> Um, so, but, but a lot of them are his, you know, some people are saying, well, that line is, is something I made up. It, it isn't the in jail, out of jail, in jail, out of jail, in jail. That's, that's Dickens. Um, I think Dickens was great at comic, um, situations and character portrayals. Um, he didn't, he found it diff more difficult, I think, to hit a punchline as someone who has been trained to hit a punchline. So I actually let the com I pulled some of the comedy out. My brother at one point, he said, this scene, I want you to use your comic skills to make this scene happen. So I had to adjust it so that it worked because I could see that Dickens was going round and round the comedy of the scene, but not landing on it. Um, it, is, it is a curious thing. So obviously he was great at doing certain things and not so great at other things, but he really wanted to be an actor first before he was a performer. And he was performing here 155 years ago and all across America, but here in, uh, in the Steinway Hall, which was part of the, you, I think Steinway Hall, Halls, Steinway Halls still exist, and that's where they sell the Steinway pianos. But it used to be at 14 and 4th, and um, there used to be a big hall there as well, where 2000 seats at, which he was playing to and doing readings on the death of Nancy and stuff. So you imagine J.K. Rowling doing reading from Harry Potter. It was that kind of gig. It was yeah. just, you know, and he, and he realized he didn't have to write anymore. He could do these gigs and make 
good, really good money. Um, and he was always desperate to make money because he'd come from no money. And, and he lived quite a full life and then he had 10 kids and all this kind of stuff. And anyway, yeah, so I just like the idea that I'm following in his footsteps, yeah. performing um, like that. Well, you're also working with one of the finest directors who is here today, Selena Cadell. Let's hear it for the director. Let's talk about collaborating with her. What's your, I mean, that's such a wonderful thing. It's like a marriage. Talk about collaborating with I her. I was Selena isn't here actually at the moment. No, but she's upstairs, right? No, no, Selena. Oh, uh, you're right. Oh, at Sarah, uh, Sarah Johnson, my tour manager is upstairs. Selena's coming in two days though. Fabulous, all right. She's coming back to check on what I've adjusted. I guess I've, I've moved certain things. And she said, yeah, oh, oh. But then, oh. but then I go, Selena, I want to keep it. But anyway, yes, yeah. she, yes she's coming in two days. But sorry, what was the, what was the Well, question? let's hear it for Selena and Sarah. Sarah, who's here today. <laughs> You know, those collaborations are so wonderful between a performer and a director. Yes, it's very handy for me because in stand-up, there is no director. Yeah. Well, I have actually worked with another director, Sarah Townsend, who yeah. directed the Believe documentary that got the Emmy nomination. And um, the great thing is, with, with I wanted to do a Shakespeare, and I was going to work my way up from Shakespeare, and then I found that no one was offering me Shakespearean roles. They don't look at me, oh, trans woman comes from comedy, does drama, but not top of our list. So I thought, right, I'll do, I'll do a Shakespeare, I'll do Hamlet, I'll do all of the roles. Yeah. So that was what I started working with Selena on. This was the thing, because we said that, I, I would talk before and said, okay, Selena, why don't you direct me in a Shakespeare? And that was a plan. And suddenly I said, I'm gonna do all the roles. Will you come in and do that? And she has worked with Dee Dee Hopkins, who's great on the movement. So we were doing this and we're doing open rehearsals, which is very interesting that opera does, I think, ballet maybe, uh, not much theater does open rehearsals, like come and see us when we're raw. And I think most actors, you know, you wouldn't get all the actors to agree to do this, but there's only one actor. And I came and I said, let's do it. So they came, we had them in Riverside Studios in Hammersmith in London. And uh, it had to, when we put out the tweet saying, I'm going to do this, it had 200, well, it's 280,000 people in, interacting with the uh, tweet, which is more than I normally get. It was just a huge, about a quarter of a million people just went, oh, Hamlet. Probably some of them thinking this is going to be a car crash. But um, then a number of them came. We gave, you know, 10 quid tickets, which, you know, I don't know, it's $13 or something. Um, so not expensive tickets. Come along and see me in a rehearsal room. Bad lighting, script lighting, and uh, just the words and me and playing five, six, seven, eight characters. And my, my agent liked it. This is why I know we're on the right track. Because my agent is, is she loves the theater. Uh, Nikki Van Gelder, and she um, she won't say what she doesn't feel. So if it's not kind of working, she would just say, "Well, you know, well, well done, and you've done good work there." But she'll choose her word carefully. But she she was really, in, I think she was thrown that it, or, or, or impressed, that wasn't expecting to find it so interesting because it's just the words. It's there's nothing else. And if you can get it right, if you can be really inside it, that's intriguing. So that's what I started with Selena with. And I said, Selena, can you come and help me on the Dickens? Because I want to do the Dickens first. And I was already up and previewing it. And so she said, yes. So we've had this. And then we're going to hopefully have the Hamlet um, soon back here oh, in, let's see. Uh, I... in New York. Yeah. yeah. Very exciting. You know, over the years, I've asked other actors, including Vanessa Redgrave and most recently Gabriel Byrne, who have done one person shows, what it feels like being on stage by yourself. And they said it is the most frightening and also the most exhilarating experience all at the same time. I don't find it frightening. As I talk, I talk yeah. about this, this fighting with fear. Yeah. And um, I went solo in 87. So. I know there is fear out there. It's like driving a car. We've all learned, a lot of people here, you've learned to drive a car. Do you remember that first time when you were learning and then you just learned and you were first time you were on your own? That, there was fear there. Will I hit th people, two people, nine people today? Will I hit trees? Will I hit dogs and cats and everything bouncing off the top? Uh, I smashed the car. Be there was a lot of that fear. And then uh, you, you get to a place where you're nowadays, if you've done, so after you've done three or four years of driving, where you're just going, so yes, no, I was talking to him the other day, I was just going over there. Oh, look at this, what are you doing? Just get out of the way and then, and, <laughs> but you, and you can even do peripheral vision driving where you're going, what the hell, who the hell was that? What a bloody idiot, anyway. So I was saying, and you, your confidence level is right up there because you know that your instincts, your peripheral vision, 
in, in fact, actually, I've analyzed this because I do a lot of analysis. Um, when I came out as trans, I self-analyzed yeah. myself to get myself to this stage where I said, this is cool, I need to come out, I need to do this. But I've analyzed that driving, if you think about it, next time you're driving, you watch, it's all, all you're doing is looking for idiots. <laughs> that is all you're doing. Because you've got all the skills, you know the rules, everyone else knows the rules, and then there are one or two idiots, or is a dog or a thing, or no. Or, or, when you get to junctions, watch yourself when you get to junctions, and, you, and you'll see cars that are going to turn across you, and you're going, is that an idiot? Is that an idiot? Uh, no, they haven't gone. I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay, we're through the junction, and we're on. You just look for idiots. That's what you do. <laughs> That's our bottom line. I like distilling what the essence is. So on stage, I know fear isn't good. There's an idea of having butterflies in your stomach and, and this kind of thing. I don't think that's good. It isn't good for me. I want to go on. I have, I, I remember seeing a guy called Shane Bourne. He's a, a, an Australian comedian. And he was playing this bear pit of a club, the, the, the Comedy Store in London, which is a similar name to Comedy Store in LA, but it is a, a different owner. So that it was it just, you know, it was different countries so they could do that. Um, but it was a b real tough bear pit of a place where people come along drunk, you know, this is two in the morning shows, so, you know, 12 to one, two in the morning, three in the morning, and people drunk and just shouting and stuff. And he was going on with a, a jumper with bears on it, with, with teddy bears, you know, like a kid's jumper or a big version of a kid's jumper. And he was just talking to people and they said, Shane, you're on. Oh, we went, oh so now we got this, we got this. It was Australian, so more like that. You know, is that Australian? It's something in the Australian era. And he was just very confident and I thought, I love the difference between off stage and where he's chatting, oh, I'm on, I'm on, I'm back on. And it was like he was walking, you know, from there to here. It was no difference. And I thought, I want that. So I've worked very hard to get the no difference between off stage and on stage. I really, I don't feel it at all. And when I do filming, I, I quite like to, because they set up for the next, you know, we're going to move the camera, we have to set up the lighting. I quite like for the lighting all to happen around me. And I just like, I ask permission if I can sit in and be the person who's getting all the lighting che checks on them because I like just staying in the area. I like having no difference, no, I don't want any razzmatazz to come on um, because then there's no difference and you can play or you can let yourself relax and, and go out and reach whatever emotions you want. So so the, the performing on my own, because I've done so much of it as stand-up, um, and street performing before that, and street performing really is the hardest thing I've ever done. So now doing drama on my own is is like a, a lovely gift because I don't have to get any laughs. I'm not trying to, you know, some people would think, great expectations, this is a drama and has a few laughs in it. I think it is a drama that has a number of laughs in and I have <laughs> brought those to the fore because I can do that. But I, all I'm really doing on there is trying to find the emotional arcs, the, the, the arcs of the characters and the emotional arcs in it and the highs and lows of, of those and trying to really be those characters so much so that I don't know quite what they're going to do. That's what, yeah. I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. I love it. We're here at the Robin Williams Center. You talked about Robin earlier. Talk about the influence he had on you both personally and professionally. Well, Robin, Robin's stand-up. I missed the early part of Robin, which you guys in, in America would know, and the Mork and Mindy, uh, early stand-up, probably going to John Carlson. We weren't getting any coverage of that in Britain. So I missed it. I remember going, uh, Monty Python and my comedy gods. And so I met Robin. Yes, thank you, one person. Um, <laughs> they are brilliant, but they know they're, they're all up on Mount Olympus, and unfortunately some of them have passed, but, <laughs> but they're on the Mount Olympus of comedy gods. And I was doing a, a stand-up workshop in 19, the winter of 87 going into 88 in London, in uh, Highgate, um, and in, in North London. And people were saying, Robin Williams, this is the comic genius place. Because the, there was, a, there was a, another stand-up, and he'd, he'd analyzed, it could be the buffoon type character, or the this, or the wordsmith, or the, uh, he had different groupings that they were his groupings. And then Robin Williams was in the comic genius area, which you sort of, <laughs> I'd like to be that, please. I don't know if anyone was... <laughs> There was one or two of us who were thinking, mm, I'd quite like to go there. But anyway, so when I met him and um, in, when I, I did a film with him, um, which is Walked Out of My Head, what the hell is the name of the film? It's a, after a Conrad um, book, um, and I did it, and Bob Hoskins was in it. And anyway, so that he was playing the professor, and, and that's the first time I'd met him. And I already knew about him, and I knew about his work, but I, it, 
by the time I'd got my stand up going and, and I'd been recorded, I hadn't really seen much of Robin's work, yeah. but it was this beautiful, I mean, it was, he was doing, he was doing improvised stuff that I couldn't do. I did things in a different way. I would find seams and, and mine these seams, but he would find new things like the, the interviews he did on, say on Johnny Carson yeah. and he would pick up things and then go with things and deal with things in the audience. There's footage of him just going into the audience and finding things and improving off that. And I did group improv, but I'd never done that kind of improv. And I'd actually sort of chosen not to do that, doing things with the audience. There's a technique you can do in stand-up where you go, hey, where are you from? Where are you from? And then they say this, and then you, you find some comedy out there. And I think I noticed that reviewers mark it down as found comedy as opposed to self-generated comedy. They say the comedy was out there, and they, yeah. this other person gave it to you. So I've, I've never wanted to play with the audience in that way. I just wanted to play in my mind and see if I could come up with some crazy stories, images that which put together, which were wonderful. So I, I loved meeting him, getting to know him. Um, and I think um, his work, and also his dramatic work as well, what he was doing is what I am trying to do, I have been trying to do, doing more and more great uh, dramatic work, um, more and more stand-up. Well, the different languages thing, is just that's just my thing that I think is good for the world to reach out and make connections and so the French kids go, hey, let's try it in English. French kids are now doing, you will not know this, but French kids are doing it in English, Russian kids are doing it in English, German kids, Spanish, the Scandinavians. It's all moving, it's all becoming much more fluid than it ever was before. And that didn't really happen before and now it does. People tour, English language is a, a, a language you can tour all around the world in. Uh, and so everyone's using it. And it's not because of anything except for Hollywood and rock and roll, I estimate, because Hollywood has a reach, rock and roll has this reach, the English language, we use as a business language, it's used as the pilot's language, you may not know that. If you're a French pilot, you have to learn English to use air traffic control, for international air traffic control. Yeah, if you're flying in France, you could use French, but if you go to another country, it'll all be English. So they not only have to learn to fly the plane, but talking to air traffic control is really tricky. And I'm doing it in a second language like crazy. But anyway, that's the English language. But Robin's stuff, he just did this fantastic stuff. And I, I was really thrown, you know, as, as everyone was when he, when he passed. And uh, that was just really rough. But he left great work. And, um, and his stand-up was kind of there. And I was told, it's a beacon. It's out there. You've got, you know... People can try and, and get to that point. And I did a gig with him. I did one gig with him. And I said this thing. I'd heard about Hendrix and the Who arguing yeah. who's going to go on last. And I said, well, who's <laughs> going to go on last? And I, th I think I said, I'll go on last. I wanted to try it. And I failed. Um, <laughs> he sort of blew it away. And I thought, right, I just got to go on it and blow it away as well. But I didn't blow much blow. So I sort of half blew it. And I thought, OK, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> But you had to try. Yes, it's ambition. But um, ambition can be a good thing. Yeah. Nelson Mandela, good ambition. Lincoln, good ambition. Trump, bad ambition. Because <laughs> <laughs> growing up, where did your love for performing begin? And what were your earliest creative outlets? Um, well, mum was an amateur dramatic. She loved her amateur dramatics. And I had no idea that until later. Um, and dad had a great sense of comedy. And as a young kid, I don't know if I quite sensed that, but I picked that up later on. Um, but mum died in 68, that hellish year of 68. Mum died a month before Martin Luther King, month, uh, two months before Bobby Kennedy. So that was, in historical terms, just <clears throat> well, a rough, rough old year. But um, then we started going to boarding school because mum and dad had decided maybe that's the way forward. Not that, I suppose, the kids who go to boarding school in your country, in America, in, in Britain, maybe around the world, it usually come from a certain political voting attitude from a certain money background because the, the fees are so heavy. Um, but dad, well, my one granddad was a bus driver. The other granddad was a cow herder. So and mum was a nurse and dad uh, was an accountant who worked his way up in, in the company that he worked at. So we didn't come from that background. But mum and dad decided that's the only way to keep the family going. Dad, you carry on, you know, Harold carried on uh, uh, working in, in, in his career because he had a career. First person in either family that ever had a career. Um, and, uh, and we went to boarding school. From, I was age at six. Mark was about seven, coming on eight. And I sort of clung on to him. And that was just really rough. But two years after that, January of 1970, I saw a play 
in Eastbourne, where, which is where Dad was born, in the south, the south coast of England, near Hastings, Battle of Hastings, you might have heard of, Brighton, you might have heard of that, right down the south coast. And uh, I saw this play, Boy with a Cart by Christopher Fry, and one kid on stage was getting a huge reaction. The audience was loving it. I remember going, oh, oh, what is this noise? I don't think I'd, had I seen this show? I don't know, I hadn't heard such concerted noise going with it. And I thought, this, this, I need to be this kid, because I think it was a substitution of love yeah. That my, uh, my mother's love, a nurse, a very loving mother, boom, she's suddenly gone from our lives. And, but this audience, oh, maybe I can go and get love from an audience. And I think that was, my, that was my desperation to be a performer. And I don't think I had it in me particularly. Mum loved to sing and she loved to do sketches and stuff and light comedy. Um, I don't know if it was really... It wasn't there grabbably in it. You know, some kids, you must, everyone knew kids at school who, who had a certain something, but not all those kids go on to do it in, in, in the long term. And I had them all, I know Dustin Hoffman struggled a long time and Gene Hackman, and I, I'm one of those people, ah, that doesn't work, I'll keep coming back, ah, oh, that doesn't work. Well, what about this? Nah, I don't like that, okay. And over 10 years, 15, 20 years, I'm funny. Okay, and now these reviews, I'm going, yeah, that's kind of, yeah. that's what I was aiming for back when I was seven. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't mind how long it takes to get there. Like a fine wine, yeah. you see, this is the fine wine approach to careers. And uh, so, yeah, I saw this at age seven, and it hasn't moved from that. There's only one thing that, that adjusted that desire to perform was uh, realizing that films uh, had people in them, and those were real people, and that they had, applied to be in those films and audition and stuff. I said, oh, I could be in films. I, I loved films. And I, I, uh, I just, I caught my imagination. I loved them on television. I started watching films and copying down the credits at the end to try and find how to get in. Because a lot of people who get into um, the creative area, that they have no one in their family who has anything linked to this. And their parents are going, well, I don't know if this is a good idea because I've heard of people struggling for many years and never getting anywhere, and that, that is true. But I was just, I was dead set. I absolutely knew it, and I wasn't going to move it. And I broke into Pinewood Studios when I was 15. That's our oh, equivalent yeah. of the Paramount or 20th yeah. Century Fox Studios. And um, I just wandered up there and said, can I come in? And they said, hang off, kid. <laughs> and I've come, Ma, I've come. Don't care. I sign, I'm going to be an actor. What, what have you been in? Well, nothing. At school? You must have been in something at school. No, not really, but I still, I'm going to be, when I'm 60, I'll get really good reviews for it. It'll be a one-woman show, but you're a boy. It's complicated. The future will come, mate, and then you will have chagrin. <laughs> that guy's there. No. But um, uh, Jerry Weintraub, when I did, uh, I did uh, uh, Oceans 12 and 13 with Jerry, and there was before I did the British Avengers with Ray Fiennes and Uma Thurman, and and I think I got the role because I talked, I because they took me out to uh, with Jeremiah Chechnik, the director, and said, um, okay, um, should we give you the role as as Sean Connery's chief henchman? <laughs> and and I think I told him that story, and I think that's probably why Jerry gave me the role. Uh, but he very nicely phoned ahead to that very same gabled entrance, which is now closed off and they don't use it anymore. Oh. And they, they phoned the, the, obviously, he must have phoned ahead to one of the gatekeepers, who's just some bloke, you know, what? Oh, Mr. Weintraub, yeah, what? And he obviously said, can you, uh, there's a guy coming along, there's a Mr. Rizzard, he's going to be in the car, and if you could just say, Mr. Rizzard, welcome to Pinewood, something like that. He obviously said, Mr. Rizzard, welcome to Pinewood, and he thought that'd be a nice thing, and it was a beautiful thing. But so... I, I felt he must have said that, because when we got there, the window went down, and we stopped, and they went, oh, Mr. Wong, yeah, Mr. Wong, in you go. Uh, we got um, we got Eddie Izzard here. Yeah, yeah, you know, whoever you want, mate, in you go, doesn't matter. No, no, I think you have a message. No, no message. <laughs> yes, you have a message. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, Harry, what was that? You've got uh, your mother's on the line. No, I don't. Something, oh yes, you've got an, uh, go in, <laughs> go in, go, you're, you're allowed to, you know, it was some garbled thing, and I think we drove off as the winner, <laughs> and, and, and all, it's okay, no, we, uh, for, uh, I think we balls that up, Harry, <laughs> yeah, that's what happened at the gate. <laughs> But I, I ran past them, that Pinewood Studios, many years later. I was going, I was running my multiple marathons. 
and I was doing five practice marathons in five days, like you did. And I realized I was going to stay at a friend's house because I thought, okay, it's in that direction. So I'll, I'll stay with my friend. And, and so I was running along. I thought, I'm going to go past Pinewood Studios. Let's try and break in again. So, so I went along and I said, can I come in? And there's guys on security, because I'm known in a kind of more cultish way, uh, to an extent mainstream, but not, not like a Hugh Jackman kind of mainstream, but it's kind of like, oh, oh, don't, you know, cool people know me. So you're all cool. Um, and the more mainstream people who are sometimes not so cool, they go, I don't, Eddie Izzard, is that a, a toilet cleaner? What is that? Is that kind of a, asbestos sheeting? I don't know. And um, so, but anyway, the, the security people there, they were very nice, but I think they were going, uh, oh, yeah, aren't you? I recognize your face. There wasn't, I wasn't top of the, you know, they weren't watching comedies or whatever it was, or Victorian Abdul. And, um, but they thought, oh, uh, I think you can come in, but I don't know. Yeah, is it? all right. Well, cool. Kevin, we've got to talk to Kevin. So they had to talk to a guy called Kevin, but he was in a meeting. He's in a meeting. So, <laughs> okay, I'll wait. Oh, all right, you know. So that went on and on and on for some time. Um, and, then, and then people turned up and said, yes, you can come in. But as I was waiting, Stanley Tucci turned up, <laughs> which was a wonderful thing. And I, I, and I realized that, I, you know, I thought, I knew you that, Stanley, because we'd met before. And he was there with his daughter, and they were going to, he was showing his daughter the makeup departments there, because uh, he now based in London. And um, I realized when I first met Stanley was when I was Tony nominated for Day of the Death of Joe Egg. And I, um, I won everything except the Tony. So out of Critics Circle and the, the Drama, Drama Desk, Desk and the Broadway.com and yep. everything. And uh, Brian Denner, he won the Tony. And he came and saw it and said, you're going to win this. And my agent in London said, apparently you're going to win this. And so apparently I was going to win everything. I was going, oh, I'm quite happy to win everything. Thank you. Um, and then I didn't win. And Brian Denner, he got the Tony. So I'm sitting in the front row. It's, I think, the second to last or the last um, award up. Uh, you know, on the, yeah. on, on the Tony's at the last one? Like or the, the third, yeah, yes, right yeah, before Best Play and Best Musical yes, yes, is your right award. Good. Yeah, so it's it's right towards the end. So uh, then Brian went off yeah. and to do press and and stuff you have to do. And at the end I got up and uh, Stanley Tucci got up, who's also nominated for Best Director, and Philip Seymour Hoffman. And I realized I'm not there doing that, but I'm here with this group yeah. who are also nominated but didn't. I thought, this is a pretty good group to be in. I thought, this experience is just for this moment here. That for, from the kid who's been watching plays when I was seven and saying, can I do that, please? I thought that was very good. So I thought I had to say something. And I said, as they, everyone, you know, all of us yeah. probably wanted to win it. And then I looked at them and I said, I thought we'd get one each. Then we get one each. <laughs> uh, I thought that was a nice thing to say. And yeah, that was my moment. Unfortunately, Phillips now. Not with us anymore, but I, 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 I see Stanley in different. Yeah. He's just such a great, they're both such great actors. So. Well, let's talk about Joe Egg for a second. Back to that, you made your Broadway debut opposite Victoria Hamilton yep. in Peter Nichols' A Day in the Death of Joe Egg. Let's hear it for that. Thank you. How magical was your debut? You and I spoke during that time period. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful because yeah. I'd done it in London. Yeah. And I'd got it up to a certain speed. There's, um, it's the drama of that, which, which I, I love doing. The comedy, there's three comedy uh, sketch scenes at the front of it, if you don't know, or if you do know the play, um, where we explain what, what has happened to our daughter who is mentally and physically disabled. And um, I got it right in New York, much better than I got it in London, because in London, I think it was my fault. I was, I was encouraging Vic, or I was ad-libbing a lot because I could, and I was ad-libbing more like myself than the character of Bry, Brian Sheila. So we had to ad-lib as Brian Sheila rather than as Eddie and Vic. And that was the thing that we made sure we did um, in, uh, on Broadway. And so, yeah, people seemed to love it. You were superb in that. Thank you. Really, really superb. Thank you. Now, Alan Rickman has played a big part in your in my beginning, in yeah, the beginning, well, yeah, because um, yeah. I was. How did it work? I got a separate agent. I have separate agents in, in comedy and drama, which I don't know if anyone else has. Um, I. I wanted to be this actor when I was a kid, at seven, and then uh, we got to puberty, and I fancied girls. I do. I fancy women. I had girls when I was a kid, and. Um, uh, and I hadn't told anyone I was trans, so I just looked a boy who fancied girls, but. 
I, I didn't feel I could act. The the love interest, the the hero, I, it just didn't sit well with me. I didn't feel that. I didn't feel sexual confidence. Um, you know, if you look like a strapping boy and great at sports and stuff. And I played a soccer, football, and um, and they didn't play at the school I went to. So all my sporting prowess had just gone out the window and I was just some kid. And I thought, well, I can do the comedy versions of this. I just, let's, let's just dump the drama and I'll do comedy. So the, I, I concentrated on comedy all the way up, but it took forever to take off. I dropped out of uni at 19. It took off when I was about 30. So 11 years of waiting to take off, I suddenly had this radical idea of, um, okay, I'm gonna get a separate agent in drama and um, I'm going to have a separate agent in comedy, and I'm going to push in two different pl places for dramatic acting roles and um, uh, and doing comedy. Why am I saying this? What was the do you remind me of the Alan question? Rickman? Oh, Alan Rickman. Yes. <laughs> so I've been doing a lot of comedy, yeah. and I got my agent. I think I'd, I'd I'd gone and done some interviews with certain agents, and Nikki Van Gelder said yes, okay, well let's try it, you know. And she she gave me the chance to try, and I'm still with her, and um, and. Um, I was at a benefit show with Alan Rickman, and and he knew the person who was arranging it, Ruby Wax. And afterwards, I was walking away from the Palladium in London. I had now sort of arrived as a stand-up. I was I'd come out and done my own piece. That was fun to be in that kind of thing after struggling for many, many years. And as I was walking, we we're walking onto some other place. We we're going to have a drink, and I said to her, "I, I really want to act." Um, and most people think I'm crazy because I do all this comedy, but I want to do dramatic acting. And he said, "I don't, I don't think that's crazy." I went, oh, well, you know, you're one of the first people to say that. And then, so we chatted about that, and then we stopped chatting about it, and then we just had drinks and carried on. And then um, Lindsay Duncan had already been signed up to do Cryptogram, David Mamet's Cryptogram, and some people were saying, um, Alan Rickman, you'd done Les Liaisons Dangereux with uh, Lindsay before. Would you like to do a pairing again? He didn't feel it was quite right for him. That role wasn't, I don't think that role was right for him at that point. And, um, but he put my name into the... He threw my name into the ring, and so they they got in touch, and and I was cast. So that's how my and that was the first play, first professional play I did, uh, first professional acting I did, and that was on uh, at the West End, in uh, the Cryptogram. Yeah, yeah. a small four hundred seater, four forty seater. Yeah. I love how at seven years old he wanted to be a serious actor, and what does he start out with? David Mamet, one of the hardest yeah, playwrights yeah, yeah. to find a rhythm with. Well, you don't question, you don't. Get, can I not start <laughs> with this one? Can I start with that one over there? No. You know, you're not yeah. get, you know, yeah. you're not being choosy at this point. You just go. No, but uh, it's wonderful how that happened. That you got to do a Mamet play. Yeah, to start yeah, with no. Lindsay Duncan. Yeah, and uh, and then later I did Race and was directed by Mamet as well. So that was that was really intriguing. Because um, you returned to Broadway here in Race. Yeah, yeah. You were the second cast that replaced everybody. So yeah. David Mamet directed you. What was it like working with him and being directed by him? Well, it was great. We had huge arguments about things. <laughs> uh, but I think we got on really pretty well. Um, but I really enjoyed doing it. And Richard Thomas is fantastic. Yeah. And, um, and Richard Thomas has a remarkable son who must be all grown up now and hopefully a brilliant designer. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I just really, I was here in your summers, and as you know, your summers are insane for someone gets a hairdryer, and God, who doesn't exist, gets a hairdryer on and says, right, here's hairdryers. And so <laughs> as you're walking through, you just find indoor buildings to go, like like up in the north, you've got all these these winter, um, you know, shopping malls where you can just go through underground and stay warm, like particularly up in Toronto and Canada or northern uh, states of America. But um, yeah, the summer's just so hot. But anyway, just to be here doing that, I just, yeah, I just love being in New York. So it, it's, uh, it's great. And I feel like I've lived here. If I add all my bits together, I've lived here for a chunk of time. Now. Yeah. Well, you know, millions of fans got to know you from your Emmy Award winning Eddie Izzard, Dressed to Kill. Yeah. Tour, which you took all over the world. How career changing was that tour for you? It wasn't. Um, it wasn't yeah. that hugely changing because it was another step in the thing. Yeah. The thing was, it went on HBO, and so in America it was hugely changing because it, a lot of people saw it, um, and it won two Emmys, and it was, um, and it went kadunk. Yeah. You know, on the, we call it snakes and ladders. You call it shoots and ladders, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, it was definitely a ladder in there because a lot of my career has just been gradually hammering my way up the the, the mountains you know and but this one was a and, it, and once it came out on hbo uh, obviously a whole bunch of people had seen it so that really helped but as i was touring that that show around the world it was another level because um 
I don't know, was it the third, fourth, third, fourth or fifth album kind of thing. So I was already hitting certain stages, but um, definitely in America it, 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 and for Canada as well, I'd say, it, uh, it really helped. Because I think I first became aware of you. Was your U.S. debut at PS 122? Yep, PS 123. In September of 1996. Yeah. And I'll never forget that. Favorite memories of that debut being here in the United States and well, playing downtown. The beautiful thing was I've, I had been trying to play New York for ages and ages and ages. I thought it's going to work. But now, people said, I don't know if any people might still think this, but it's actually not true. The idea that American humor is this and British humor is that. There is not this and that about it. It's just broadly in every kind. And same with, I do, we in Britain say, you might say in America, the, the uh, French have a visual sense of humor. That's not true. That's just because the only thing we could see was Jacques Tati, and he was very visual. And so oh, <laughs> that's all they do. And that's not, of course, sort of true what they do, because they do a whole load of stuff. And then the Germans have no sense of humor. That's because of World War One and World War Two, and we were on different sides. And so the truth is, there are certain British people who have no sense of humor. Certain Americans have oh. no sense of humor. Certain, they tend to all be right-wingers. Um, certain <laughs> French have no sense of humor. I don't think Marine Le Pen has any sense of humor. Um, it, it's, 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 it's that kind of thing. But broad, there's a broadly a mainstream sense of humor and a more alternative sense of humor in, in every country. So, um, so that's the thing that I, I, that I hooked up with. So playing PS122, I thought I could do it, but I couldn't persuade anyone over here in New York to help put me on. That was the tricky thing. But once we did it, we did one performance, and then we all sat down and worked out, OK, now where are we going to tour in America? We just knew it was going to work. Um, but also there's an interesting thing that people would say, oh, this is, this is, Brit this is British humor. And, and I, I analyzed that I needed American to American word of mouth. I knew that Python had already hit here, and that was very British. And even the references, which is some of them are just nonsensical to anyone who hasn't learned what they are, just like when we listen to uh, so certain American stand-ups, I can't work out what they're saying. Or The Simpsons, and they might reference someone, or Sophie Tucker. If you don't know who Sophie Tucker is, it can't be used as a punchline. Or if it is used as a punchline, we go, I don't know what Sophie did, but now I knew. And I, uh, Lawrence Welk is Lawrence Welk. It was a bad leader. <laughs> this is because um, I played Lenny Bruce, and yeah. and there was a lot of these lines or punchlines. What is this, like Sophie Tucker? And it goes. Yeah, but if you know them, then you can know them. Anyway, my point is, where's my point going? Um, 1996 landing in, it seemed to work, but I, but I would hold tickets back. I would hold 10% of tickets back. When 97, 98 at Westbeth, um, I'd say, can we hold 10% of tickets and not sell them so that if some American people have been told, okay, we'll check it out, um, New Yorkers come. I, I wanted them to say, I wanted American to American word of mouth because I thought that would work. Because I thought yeah. if a British person said to an, uh, a New Yorker, an American, and someone in the rest of America say, this is good, you'd like this, they say, no, your humor is different. I thought the American, this is, this is a different thing. I don't think I get that stuff. Yeah. But if an American said, no, you like it, Larry, Kenny, <laughs> Siobhan, <laughs> any American, yeah, you'd like it. I liked it. Oh, you, Kenny, you liked it? Yeah, I liked it. So, and I knew it was there because Python yeah. had already proved it. And so all I had to do was be here and then play kind of the U2 approach to doing it, Chris. Just relentlessly play and play and play and play and play and play and play, and play until the, the, the whole country gives in. All oh, right, we'll go. <laughs> and now I've played every state, every yeah. all 50 states, which I don't think many, which I think is good, including like Mississippi and, uh, and, um, and Alabama and places where you think, well, yeah, they're not going to go for it. But there's cool people in every state. And hopefully, you know, you've got two Democratic uh, senators in, in Georgia now, and, and hopefully things are changing, even though they look like they're going backwards at some times, they're also going forwards. I think that's what happens in the world as well. Some things are going backwards, some things are going forwards. Yeah. So we just have to keep moving things forwards, and then hopefully things will swing around, and maybe there will be some consequences to lying in politics. That would be interesting. That would be interesting. Yeah. Some consequences yeah. to lying. I love that all 50 states, and you've done like 45 countries. Yep, yep, yep. And for the four languages, which is beautiful. Yeah. And the last show I developed yeah. in, in French and German. So I normally, I don't write shows. I just go on stage and go, hey, ch cheese, what's going on with cheese? What's all about with cheese? So uh, do, uh, do cows eat cheese? If you feel, is that cannibalism? Is that what, you know, I just, I just muck around with <laughs> themes on a cheese. And if there's not many, I'll go, okay, let's not talk about cheese. Let's talk about herring. 
or Ratatouille or yeah. dogs or God or playing the banjo. And I just, yeah. but then I said, why don't I do this in French? Because Brexit <laughs> haven't, I was totally against separation, pulling back, running and hiding from other countries. So I said, well, I'll develop this show, start, start off in France. So I did it in two months in Paris. And I was going, le fromage, qu'est-ce qui se passe? <laughs> C'est bon, un fromage, c'est une vache, mange le fromage, c'est cannibalisme. <laughs> peut-être oui, peut-être non. Mais j'ai un confiant. And I, I would ad lib in French. And if there's a trick, if you don't know in any language, if you don't know the, the, the word for that in that language, just do it in English with an accent. <laughs> of, it's more likely to work in the Latin based yeah. languages. I'm sure if you get to, to any of the more Asian languages, that, that won't work. But I, did, I was touring France. And I was with a, a young a French comedian called Yassine Balous, who does beautiful yeah. stuff, Algerian French kid, does st stuff very similar to mine. And, and I was on, I was trying to say that I'm, I'm, I'm focused. I'm a, I, j'ai un focus. I said, j'ai un focus, which means I have a false ass. <laughs> and, uh, so it, non plus the audience. <laughs> and you get full yeah. Le focus, c'est possible. Wrong with that. Anyway, so sometimes it goes wrong, but still it's funny. But, to have had to spend two months because I'm, I'm I'm here for two months. Two months in in New York is wonderful. If you imagine if you live in New York, spending two months in London or Paris or whatever. I did two months in Paris. It's like being in a film. You like because everything what you're used to is all changed uh, uh, to a certain extent. And uh, yeah, Chris, uh, December and January in, in Paris was just gorgeous. It was raining. It was yeah. tough. It was thing, but and we lived up in Montmartre, which is right at the top and. The, um, and it's very touristy on certain bits, the Place du Tertre, where they do all the paint. And they would always come up and say, uh, un dessin, un dessin, you know, they want to. And I go, je passe un tourist, pas un I work here, je travaille ici, je travaille ici, monsieur. Qu'est-ce qui se passe? And, um, but I, I just loved being up there. And uh, yeah, I'm going to go back and do that and tour more France, tour Germany, tour Spanish speaking countries. We can go Central America, South America now. Um, Todo en Espanol. Si, si, senor. It's going to be good. And all you've got to do is, is want it enough yeah. and, and just push, push, push like crazy. I love it. Want it enough. That's wonderful. Great to live by. You have given us so many memorable performances on stage, screen, and television. So I'd like to mention some of the highlights. Just tell me what comes to mind, a fun story or a great memory. Oh, bloody hell. Right. <laughs> Here we go. You have shared the screen with Dame Judi Dench in Victoria and Abdul and Six Minutes to Midnight. What is it like working with her? Well, I, I, can, I, I have a story that I keep telling uh, about Judy, which is um, um, we, she was playing Queen Victoria. I was playing um, Edward the Seventh, who's going to become Edward the Seventh, Eddie Seventh, as I call him. But he was um, <laughs> he was the Prince of Wales at that point, and they didn't get on. Uh, but anyway, we'd, we'd been shooting one day, and I was listening to Ray Charles' track "What I Say," and I, and I was playing this in the makeup trunk. And, and I just started dancing to it, and then Judy started dancing to it as well. So Edward VII and uh, Queen Victoria were dancing to a Ray Charles track, which I thought was quite groovy. And I realized that she's in touch with the teenage girl inside her. She's still, she's, because it's the young and the young at heart that will save the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is permanently young at heart. And uh, it's the old and the old at heart. You take it backwards, you see. They say, oh, wasn't the 50s good? Wasn't, wasn't it good in the 1420s? I think the 1420s, let's go back. <laughs> The old days when everyone hated each other and you could <laughs> stab someone with a knife with impunity. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so anyway, but she's just relaxed and chilled and fun and likes a chocolate hobnob, which is these chocolate biscuits and, have some, uh, and likes a glass of champagne. And um, she's just, yeah, she, she is how she seems is how she is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just great fun to work with. And... Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, she used to come to my stand-up shows, you see. Um, yeah, she used to come to the stand-up shows, so I knew her from that. And then suddenly, Stephen Freer said, you're going to be in this Victorian Abdon. And suddenly, I was doing drama with her, which was beautiful. Uh, and one day, I went, there's, a, there's the Dur Durbar room. And if you watch Victorian Ab Abdon, there's one room that's, that, that the real Queen Victoria made that into a very Indian um very um, respectful. The taste was all designed in an Indian style. And so I'd been in the Durbar room and she hadn't seen it because it's in a, we were shooting in the actual old palace. And I said, can we go down and see it? And, and the people who ran the place, I think English Heritage, and they said, yeah, we can go down now. So I said, Judy, do you want to go down and see it? So we went down 
I was dressed as um, Henry, uh, as Edward the Seventh, and she was dressed as Queen Victoria. <laughs> and we walk into this place, which is where she used to be. And then there were there's only about five people in at that time of the day. It was just an odd time. There was only five people, and they look around. And suddenly, you got Judy Dench over there, and I can see them get a camera up like this. And I was going, no, 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 no camera, no camera. She's off duty. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was it was just fun hanging out with her. So. Yeah. Yeah, these are, yeah. I love, I just love doing film. Films on location, it is the best thing ever. It's just. Could you've done a lot of films on location. Yeah, I uh, have I? Yes, I think I have. I mean, studios are great, but the, the actual studios and stuff, don't, the actual studio that you shoot in yeah. has no atmosphere. I quite like being on studios because I did break into studios, but. Um, <laughs> that was like you got to yeah. Pinewood. Yes, I have been back to film there <laughs> and I've walked around with impunity. I am, I'm, can I go over here? What? Uh, just get, I don't care, mate. <laughs> The truth is, on most studios, there's lots of people doing lots of different things, and no one is is, is actually checking no. really to see are you doing this, you know? Because once you're inside the thing, I think you're inside the thing. Yeah. But I, whenever I film at Pinewood, I do go this. This is where I broke into, you know. And um, oh, and Spielberg broke into um, Universal at 17, so I broke in a bit earlier. His career took off slightly yeah. more, slightly more like a rocket. Get more ladders. He, he, yeah, he, yeah. He went, like, mine was more the fine wine, as I said, the fine wine. So by the time I'm 100, it's just really worth watching. It's, uh, totally. It's just going to get crazy. You played, is it Roman Nagel? Yes. A master thief in both Ocean's 12 and Ocean's 13. <laughs> Love those films. How much yeah. fun was that? Well, it was great to get a call from again, Jerry Weintraub, because I... Um, <laughs> Um, done uh, the British Avengers film and yeah. uh, said, do you want to come down? We, we got this character. Steven Soderbergh had just decided, hey, introduce another character. That could help us with this story problem we have. And I don't know whether Jerry threw my name into the hat or, but and but he, he, I was in my bedroom back in London and go, yeah, J uh, Jerry, I'll come down to Rome. I'll come down. Okay, it's talk to George. Here's George. Hi, Eddie. Do you want to come down? <laughs> so I talked to George Clooney. Yeah, uh, all right, George. I'll just check my diary. No, I don't need to. I've set fire to my diary, and it uh, doesn't really matter. I'll come. So, yeah, two weeks, and it was... Everyone's wonderful. Everyone was most welcoming. We sat on the roof of the Derussi Hotel near Place del Popolo in, in, uh, in June, something like June in, in uh, Rome, if you can imagine that. So it was crazy doing that and playing poker every night and it was it, they had a food set up there which was a what do you want yeah uh service what what do you want uh oh uh ch chicken you know whatever you just make things up and a drink what do you want you just it made, it made those up and it was on the roof and the sun was going down over rome crazy beautiful beautiful time and then the second uh, then 13 was shot uh in more vegas and la but they need to do some additional shooting. So I did spend two days at Jerry Weintraub's house, a weekend, I think Saturday and Sunday, and just me and George and Brad um, uh, for two days. Which, and oh. they don't say much. I just go, okay, I think it's this, I think the problem is yeah. that, the problem is this, the problem is that. And I, I remember Steven Soderbergh saying, okay, I'm gonna start the camera on George and pull back and then I'm just gonna move in. He just wanted to try just some quite a simple thing for the scene. And I realized I was talking, and if I, I was going to be, it's going to be on the back of my head most of the time because obviously the camera was favoring George <laughs> and Brad because of their profile and because they're very good looking guys. And, and then I'm this kind of nerdy guy in the middle. So I decided to do the entire scene <laughs> pointing backwards. Okay. <laughs> right, you can't say, you can't, but, uh, kind of like a uh, daytime soap opera kind of, I see what you said. You got to point over the end. So, so that I could stay in the camera. I think that, I don't think that, take got in. I, don't, <laughs> I think Stephen went, oh, I can't, can't use that. <laughs> but you know, you got to hustle, man. It's, um, I'm going to be hustling. I'm going to be 99 and going, come on, can I do that? I can do this thing. I can play um, this scene forward. <laughs> yeah, I can do it in different ways. Because yeah, this is, if I get, to, if I get to, into film uh, drama now, I'm prepared to uh, improvise the entire scene half improvise it, yeah. uh, do it with, or, or do it with the directors who's very particular, who needs their commas in. I can do it any which way. I like having those gears. I'm training myself to be able to do anything. And I've got to go into politics now, so, so I've got to disappear for 10, 15 years, and then I've got to come back, and I know, but the, I know, I have to go. I don't want to go away, but I have to go away, because I have to do this. 
is that about there's Trumps and there's Boris Johnsons and they just they are one lie ahead of the last lie and that's this new technique they've come up with oh I just keep lying and then we go hang on what about oh this now we deal with this lie oh there's this lie oh this lie oh. and that's not great for our, our world but I do think 99% of the world are trying to live and let live yeah and then there's a small group of people who just just a sad people who just yeah who've got a long way from lying well, let's just get into politics for a minute. I love what, that you've gotten involved in politics. And you've been involved in politics for a while, haven't you? Yeah, I joined the Labour Party in 1995. I've mm -hmm. been a, an activist since 2008 in a lot of uh, different elections. But uh, yeah, and I've done my marathons raising money, yeah. which is like human politics, really. You know, that's just... Let's talk about that. We're going to talk, we'll get into this too, because you have raised millions and millions of pounds and dollars for sport relief. Sport Relief is the overarching uh, okay. charity in Britain. And then they give it out to many, many different charities across the UK and the world. And then I made up um, a fund, Make Humanity Great Again. Yes. I don't know where I got that. Um, <laughs> it seemed very inclusive. Yeah. And so we sell MHG hats. And, um, and we, you know, we want people in America to be great. And, and in Britain and in France and Germany, <laughs> every country of the world, all eight billion people, let's make us great again. And um, so, yeah, and we raise money and uh, we help charities all around the world. And I was born in Yemen as well to try and I raise over a hundred grand for them. For yeah, they're just having a proxy civil war, a proxy civil war. What a crazy idea that that even exists. So yeah, you know, just do what you can to uh, try and help. But you do a lot of this by marathons, right? By running. Yeah, I do multiple marathons where you yeah. run. The first one was 43 marathons in 51 days around the UK. Then I did 27 marathons in 27 days uh, on my second attempt in South Africa. Um, but I had to stop on the fifth day, so I had to do a double marathon on the last day of that. Then I did 29 marathons, 29 days around the capital cities in Europe. And then I did 31 marathons, 31 days in on a treadmill during COVID lockdown in a in a secure kind of bubble environment um, where we didn't meet any other people we were interacting with. But I used to do, I was doing a gig at the end of each marathon as well, which is a bit crazy. Were you always a runner? Uh, no, I, I liked running quite fast when I was a kid playing yeah. soccer and, uh, and athletics, but uh, the long form running, the long distance running seemed like pointless when I was a kid. But if you're doing it for a charity, it seems like, you know, it's a good thing to keep you going. And if you um, encourage other people and it's, it's quite an adventure, the health aspect in it. And so, so yeah, I, I, I don't know if I like doing it. I like getting them done. I like raising the money. I like helping and I'll just keep doing them. Well, thank you for that. Your charity work. Like well, I said, millions. I mean, if you look at how much money you've raised, Back to some of your movies, Velvet Goldmine is one of my favorite movies, where you play Spin Doctor, it's Jerry Devine? Yep. Yeah, opposite John Reith Myers. Um, favorite memories of working on that? With well, it was, it was great, Todd Haynes yeah. directing. I remember there was, there was a time, it says, okay, you just get into the Rolls Royce, and we're just gonna drive up and down a dual carriageway. I don't think we had really got kind of permission for this. It says, we're gonna be in a van just coming past you and shooting out the side. So just have fun in the Rolls Royce. And I, I was just standing up with a cigar and just looking, it was just kind of crazy. It was an open top Rolls Royce. Um, so a lot of fun things like that. Doing an orgy, filming an orgy at 10 in the morning <laughs> with a, a wonderful woman called Emily Wolf. Uh, everyone was kind of paired up and as, as it takes went on up to take 10 and take uh -huh. 11. Everyone got a lot more involved by the because it was a steady cam going on, and you just had to keep going because you didn't know where the camera was. So um, yeah, just it, it was great fun to do, um, and uh, yeah, working with Ewan McGregor as well. Oh, yeah. I just loved doing it. So it was at Tribeca Film Festival. It was it was uh, being celebrated just recently, and I came back over for that, but got COVID the morning I arrived, so oh. I had to sit in a hotel room for ten days, which wasn't so great. It wasn't the best way to see. New York, yeah, in a hotel room, looking out the window. Like but I love it. Even in a film at that at that amount of money, you're still doing kamikaze shots. Like we don't have a permit for this. Just have fun in the, in the, yes. the Rolls Royce, right? Well, it was it yeah. was you know it's all independently financed, yeah. so um, um, everything was was you know just do get what you can. But I like the idea that you just go out and film what you can. Yeah, one of my favorite films of yours is Shadow of the Vampire. This is a great movie. If you haven't seen this, go ahead, clap. 
It's about the making of the vampire film Nosferatu, mm. where you co-starred opposite John Malkovich, Willem Dafoe, Udo Kier. Mm. I mean, what did you enjoy the most about doing that? Could you play an actor in that? Uh, yes, I played yeah. Gustav von Wangenheim, yeah. who, if you watch, it's, uh, it's the making of uh, the film Nosferatu, the German film about vam the vampire story, but he didn't have the rights for to do the story, I don't think, so he, he did this one, he made this one up. Um, in our story, there is a conceit that to f that um, the direct Murnau was the director, and he did location filming as well, which hadn't happened before in Germany or even around the world. I don't think it was really happening at that point. But the idea, the, uh, Stephen Katz script, and he said, "Why don't we make?" Or he had the conceit of of writing um, the, the vampire that they get for film no. to film the story is actually a vampire, and that's it's, it's a beautiful. <laughs> Little thing who starts sucking blood out of the crew, and you know, <laughs> people are dropping left, right, and center. So, um, and that was Will Defoe, who was Oscar nominated for that. Um, so, yeah, it was great. And I just, we, we were in Luxembourg and we were up in a castle. I do remember I was up in a castle, and uh, they, set, they set up, if you've been on film sets, they set up these little tents yeah. in case it rains and it was raining. And I was in there with uh, a, 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 um, with both Will Defoe and uh, John Malkovich. And I had this great idea of saying, what did your parents say when you said you wanted to act? And so you get these real raw stories about, you know, what parents think. It's used, very rarely is it said, oh, they were totally into it. Yeah. They said, go for it. Now they told me what they thought, but I can't remember what the hell they said. So, so it makes this story kind of useless. <laughs> um, but next time I meet them both, I'm going to ask them, what did it, I asked the question again, and then I said, right, I'm going to memorize that. I'm going to write it down, <laughs> the salient point, so I can repeat that as just one story yeah. so that I remember it from back then. But yeah, just just um, just hanging out. I remember I was uh, one night we at a hotel just outside the, the, the castle in Luxembourg that we were shooting. Um, oh, that, that day, um, if you watch the film, you'll see a bit where... Uh, John Malkovich is playing Mona, the director, who was saying, "Okay, Gustav, now you're coming down. Now you see, you see the monster. You see, uh, you see Shrek, and and what, 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 what do you feel? Oh, and he was telling me emotions to feel. So I decided to just do what John was telling me to do, and that's exactly how silent actors used to work. You know, a lot of the directors were saying, "You feel this, and you see that. And you see him now. Oh no, what is that? Oh God, aren't you scared? Aren't you scared, Gustav? Are you scared? Show that." And and because there was no sound. The director could talk over them. So I thought, so I decided to just go with it. And that's, I don't think anyone's quite had that situation where you can be a, a real silent actor since the, you know, to, since the jazz singer came out, since, you know, mid 20s. So that was quite a beautiful thing to be. But anyway, so afterwards, a lot of us were, there was some crew and cast and, and um, Will Defoe and John Markovich sitting around the table. And I had to do an interview, I think, in the middle of it. Um, and so I had to go away from this table. Everyone was chatting just Hollywood stories, and I love Hollywood stories. I just think it's great. And that was, you know, John and all of them just talking about, oh, do you know that driver in Tunisia? Yeah, I've had the same driver, you know, this kind of stuff. And I just think that's fantastic. And I was going, this is great. I, I'm, I'm now, I've just come away from this thing. And, it's, and I just like hanging around and hearing those kind of stories because it's fun. Great cast, it's a great movie. If you haven't seen Shadow of the Vampire, great movie. So on television, you've captivated audiences with your beguiling performances. One of them is Dr. Abel Gideon in Brian Fuller's series, Hannibal. Yes, yes, yes. What did you enjoy the most about playing that role and doing that? Well, it's it's a very, it's a, <laughs> Ryan's imagination, it's a very tricky thing. We had the mayor of, what I found intriguing was that everyone was being you know sliced up and a lot of, body parts and hell hellish things going on. But the mayor of Toronto at that time was doing coke, doing a lot of coke and, you know, and, and there were all these viral videos coming out of tape of him saying he, he was, what he was, doing. I think it was crack cocaine he was doing. And so I remember we were watching it with some, someone, uh, you know, on the set and we're going about to do a thing. I said, have you seen this? And it's the, they're sitting there, he was the elected mayor and he was saying, oh, yeah, I was taking this crack cocaine or whatever he was saying. Going, going, oh, this is awful, awful. Right, okay, now we're going to slice your leg off and put your thing and then, <laughs> put your, you know. And so everything we were doing was kind of, you just, you just get used to it because yeah. um, otherwise it's, um, uh, it's uh, you, you just lose your mind, yeah. I think. But then what, the, what this uh, 
um, mayor was doing, we said, well, that's appalling. Well, this is just fun. Um, <laughs> so you just had to get used to it. But I did like uh, dropping myself into that cat. You know, it's a scary place to go to, but um, uh, I liked doing it. And Brian was just very accommodating. And working with uh, Mass Mikkelsen was fantastic. Um, just sitting opposite a big table with him yeah. and uh, going head to head. So, yeah, I just love the challenges that. And then you fly into Toronto and you go out again, you come in and do a few scenes. Yeah. Well, it's then good. you also starred in one of my favorite TV series. You starred in and served as executive producer on the critically acclaimed FX series, The Riches. <laughs> love that show. Yes, it was great. We, we, we drive, drove around in this, this uh, um, what do, you, what do you call it? Um, an RV. Yeah. This huge RV. The one on the pilot, if you ever watched the pilot, um, I wanted to drive it and I wanted to throw it around. So, um, because we you know, have opening shots, we get late to the, to the um, mini driver being released from prison. And I just came up and the brakes were a spongy. It was a really old wreck. <laughs> and so when you, when you sh I got it up to some lick and I thought I'll just slam on the brakes and that'll have a dynamic, we're late and we're arriving. And when you put on the brakes, you just kept going for another, because <laughs> it was spongy brakes. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, God, I love doing that. And uh, uh, the pilot yeah. down in New Orleans, I think it was first pilot after, after uh, Katrina. I think it was the first TV pilot. Yeah. And they were doing Deja Vu as well. And Denzel Washington was there doing that. That was the film that was on and we were doing that. And then coming back to LA and, and filming that. So yeah, I loved doing it. And we had a, we had passionate fans, but not quite a big enough army to go beyond two seasons, which was unfortunate. Such a great show. Yeah. Such a really it. great show. Thank you. You've worked as a voice actor on numerous films. What do you enjoy the most about creating characters with your voice? Well, if they could possibly let me just go free, yeah. um, then I can come up with a lot of very weird stuff, um, which is just like what, there's something that, that, that Robin did on Aladdin, yeah. where he just was going out there and seeing where he could land. And um, I can do that too. So sometimes they will say, they will just give me free reign and say, okay, go for the script and then see where you get to. Yeah. Um, and that, those are the, the, the ones which I find really fun. Um, sometimes they don't always work so well. They, just the film doesn't quite land. Yeah. But um, there's, uh, there's there's Rock Dog. There's one I did Rock Dog, which I, I love doing, playing this rock and roll star cat who was a recluse and was trying to come up with his next hit. <laughs> and uh, I'll just t I talked a lot of weird weirdness on that. Um, yeah, and I, I sometimes <laughs> rewatch it because it is it's very silly. So yeah, that's. That's what I kind of like to do. I like to do drama and I like to do my comedy in, in voiceover stuff because it kind of it feels separate because your face isn't there. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I, I like doing them. I haven't done one for a while, but yeah, I do like doing them. Yeah. Your recent autobiography, Believe Me, entered the top 10 in the New York Times and Sunday Times bestseller list. How cathartic was it to write? Yes, it was very good to write. Um, if, if people want to hear it, I, I encourage them to get the audio book because the audio book's yeah. got not only footnotes, but footnotes on footnotes. And I did it in real time and I changed things. And I talked about my first ever girlfriend playing Kiss Chase when I was about seven. <laughs> and then I said, I've met her since I wrote the book. And and so I, I added that to uh, Nicole Cunningham. I, I'd met her in the, back in Eastbourne, bizarrely. So I, so I mentioned that in the audio book. So the audio book goes slightly further on. And uh, like doing early comedy, um, with a chemistry teacher who took who took such is took his time to write things on the board, and so it meant that you could you could lob in comedy lines because he was slow enough. You take the sodium and you take some Na, you take some Cl, chlorine, and that makes is it soap. No, it's not soap. It's salt, isn't it? And you can put that on your grandmother, sir. No, not on your grandmother. So I just I kept throwing. I learned, I, I thought this is good practice for comedy. But then I found my brother was doing exactly the same thing. Um, <laughs> and he became which, a writer. Yeah, and well, because we, we me, dad, and my brother had the same sense of humor. It's very close. His might be slightly drier. Yeah. I might be slightly more bonkers, but. Um, well, we have a few, few minutes left, so there are a few audience questions that are really fascinating. This is from Sebastian. Any advice for someone who is transgender and starting to transition? Any advice on how to get my father more accepting so that he isn't embarrassed by my transition? Beautiful question, Sebastian. <clears throat> it's a big question. Yeah, it, I don't know how to, you know, my mom had died when I was very young. 
my dad was accepting when I came out, but I, I talked to him six years after I came out because um, uh, there was an idea that he might not be able to take it. I thought he could take it, but anyway, there was a six year delay. And he said he was cool and mum would have been cool if she'd been still alive, um, which was a really nice thing for him to say. I'm, I'm not sure what you can do to how you can change parents' minds. I think you just have to live your life and try and do as positive and as useful things you can do in life. And then they, by, by them seeing that, they might hopefully slowly come around. Some people won't, and some people will, but I don't, I'm afraid I don't really have a magic pill. I do know to say, live your own authentic life. I mean, I came out in 1985, so it's um, so long ago, but it was, Tough wasn't tough for my, uh, you know, my dad because I didn't tell him for six years. But it was, you know, some people in the streets were very uh, rough. People having abuse. I just decided that I would. It was my fight, and I would fight it, and I would make space for myself. And then it's a bit like being at the front of a peloton, like in the Tour de France. The, 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 because if you if you're at the front of a load of cyclists, you you can take a lot of the wind pressure, but other people can slipstream behind. So I always thought I'll do what I can. And if other people felt a bit like me, they could slipstream behind that. Um, and I've just pushed and pushed, to just try and try and create a space for myself. I don't quite know how to, because everyone's minds are made up in different ways, and some people are just locked, and some people are open. I have heard people being very negative and then coming round. Um, but there must be some who don't. So I, I don't, yeah, I don't have an easy answer to that, I'm afraid. But I'd say you've just got to. I was prepared not to talk to my dad ever again. That was my that was my thing. And if some people won't get there, you have to say that is their problem, and you have to just live your life, be that, be happy, find the happiness for yourself, and be your authentic self. Beautiful. Thank you for that. This is from Lauren. As a dyslexic performer, could you share the tools you use and advice for other dyslexic actors or writers? Um, well, it's the it's the reading, it's the sight reading that is is going to affect my dysle uh, you know my dyslexia would affect. So if I'm reading straight from a uh, thing, if they said, "Here's the script. Now do that, and that's your audition," that would be hellish. But because everyone's doing self tapes on on camera you could do the first one not getting well you could, first of all learn the lines so so that, yeah. that and i can do that and i can get them in my head and then i i get around the the effects of my dyslexia on me my spelling doesn't come into it um i do i don't write my stand-up and that's like a, almost a gift from not uh, from from being dyslexic because i don't have to write it it might be easier if i did write it but I just workshop it. I just come up with ideas and workshop it in, into a certain place. As regards acting, it is purely the sight reading that it would really affect. And uh, I don't do that. So I just learn the lines and, and then sometimes say the lines or something that approximates the lines. Because I have found that I can approximate very well, which is rather odd. But I, um, sometimes directors are OK with that. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes I feel it needs to be precisely these words. But it, yeah. I, that's how I get around it. And I don't find that the dyslexia itself is the, is the problem. My problem initially on film sets was getting the confidence, pushing back the fear on all this, log it up, get right, yeah. ding, bell, ding, 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 ding. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, rolling, rolling. That used to freak me out. Not, not overtly freak me out, but it's just like, God, that's a lot of noise. Yeah. Um, and now I don't hear it. I don't hear it. And I actually, the one thing I do from all performing, no matter what it is, is I am eager to get out there and do it. I will arrange myself to my mind so that I am eager to get out there and do it. And that way, it's always going, it's always going to be positive, even if you're doing gigs in French or German. Spanish, German is the hardest, really. But I think, OK, where will I get to in German tonight? Wo auf Deutsch uh, will I get to tonight? Because I don't know the last bits in German. This is from Jill. Are you still doing stand-up? And if so, when are you planning your next tour here? 
Um, I do do stand up and uh, will do stand up, but there's no tour overtly being booked at the moment. I have uh, Great Expectations and Hamlet to land. Or Great Expectations has has landed now. That spacecraft has landed. Um, I now need to roll that to to Main West End or Main Broadway, um, and or and get Hamlet on its feet. So those are the things I'm concentrating at the moment. So I'm going to do a lot of film work, and I've got other film work that's that's coming through at the moment. So I'm going to keep doing that. But stand up, you know, I do love doing it, but there's nothing planned at the moment. I'm afraid. So finally, what do you love the most about being? a performer, a comedian, an actor? Which part do I love most? All well, of them, just be- Film yeah. drama is what I love the most. Yeah. Film drama is what I love the most. It sounds a little bit weird, but what's the most fun is actually live group improv. There, yeah. I've had the most fun doing that. I can have a lot of fun doing stand-up. I really love doing what I'm doing at the moment because yeah. it's, I think it's going, what I love doing, actually, what I really love doing above all in all of them is going off, off piste, really. Because if off piste in skiing or snowboarding is when you go off the, the arranged routes and you go, oh, let's just go over there. Um, that's intriguing for people who do that. And for me, to do gigs in French, that wasn't on the list. There was no list that said, and now you must do it in French. And then you do it in German, and then you do it in Spanish, and then hopefully Russian and, and Arabic as well. That, that just not on the list. I love going off the list. You go to a place where nothing's really ha happened like that. I mean, other people have done it before like that. It's just, it's not on a standard list. Your agent's not saying, you got to get out there and do that French gig, man. It's just, <laughs> why are you only doing one language? God damn it. That's not, that's not really happening. And so what we're doing now with Great Expectations, be very interested to see Selena when she does come in two days' time, what she thinks of what I'm doing. Because last night, uh, Pip and Estella had a conversation at the gate, which they've never had before. <laughs> and I, felt, I just thought Pip needs to react to Estella because that's the first time. He, and he doesn't really react because he gets hit by her like a bolt of lightning. And I thought I wanted to show that. So this little conversation happened. <laughs> um, and I don't quite know what they're going to say to each other. So, and that's kind of interesting because it makes it molten. I love the idea of molten. Um, dialogue. It's not that it comes right off the rails and that you're making whole scenes up and go, but just that they can augment things. It makes it very live. So that's what I like. And hopefully people feel that when they're watching. Well, they do. If you haven't seen Great Expectations, you have another month that runs through February 11th. Thank you for spending the afternoon. I know you have a show to do tonight. Okay, yes. So thank you very much. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Eddie Izzard. Thank you.